when you're in the primary care physician's office and they're coming at you with a needle, you know what's going on and you can say, like, ah, I don't know that I can sense. But generally speaking, there's a conversation beforehand, et cetera, et cetera. There is or is not a conversation beforehand, which is a problem in, in newborn screening. But you must actively opt out. You, 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 and you have to know you can opt out, opt out, so that's another little, very little secret. But in some states, um, it was actually at one time, for instance, Nebraska prohibited that you could opt out. And if you refused, uh, there was a case where a parent refused uh, for their child, and the child was taken into CPS custody. Mm -hmm. So that's like the true, to be mandatory, you must have a consequence if you don't do it, and that was the true consequence. Although it went to court and it was resolved and the child was given back, um, we could discuss the teeth of that. But it is mandatory. It is administered by the state. So you've seen one state and you weren't screening program, you see it once. You could live in one state, be born in, you could live in D.C., be born in Maryland, and you'll have a different test, as, as, depending if you were born in Maryland, perhaps, testing sex than if you were born in D.C. Each state decides its own program, well, who it's, what it's going to screen for, how it's going to screen, how it's going to follow up, what data it's going to collect, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but there is some federal oversight. I use quotations because the oversight is largely recommendations from the federal level about most often which disorders should be screened. So some uniformity was attempted by what we call the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel or the RUS in the um, early 2000s, which was, okay, the federal committee through HHS uh, said these are the, at that time, these 29 disorders we think all states should screen for. But they have no teeth to enforce it except to say, we believe this is how it should be. So this is what I mean by federal oversight. And some federal um, funding assistance through Title V, uh, federal grants and um, block grants, and also through <coughs> programmatic funding that comes out of HRSA or the CDC, sometimes DNA, to help either implement organ research, uh, implement these disorders and organ research. But that is not standard. It comes as it comes as a question of <coughs> Important notice before we begin. It's only taken me 13 years to put this slide up. I, because if I don't say it, it is, it is people think I said it, like they hear it somehow, like there are other voices in the room. So I want to be clear. <coughs> Newborn screening is a successful program. It is in fact one of the most successful public, if not the <coughs> successful public health programs in the United States, and it should continue. I have no intention to dismantle the program. I believe it is successful. I believe it should continue. But all screening has harm. If you disagree, you are deluding yourself. Everything has a harm. I'm not saying the harm means that you should get rid of the program. I'm just saying every screening program has a harm. And newborn screening is no different. And I would posit it is unethical to ignore them. It is, in, it is unethical from a, a point of offering a program to a, uh, an individual or a screening option and not ensuring that the balance of benefits and harms is skewed to the benefits. It is deep only more so when it is mandatory. That's my slide about mandatory. Because we have deemed it so that the parents must largely go into and we haven't given them this out that's very sort of well, um, uh, widely uh, known in some cases. And finally, failing to examine them counts as ignoring. So saying, well, we've never seen harm because you've never looked counts as ignoring. So you, you, you this, was, this, this is exceedingly important. And, and when you look, you have to have done your best due diligence. I'm not saying you have to look. I'm not saying we're blowing hearts out of the worship, I'm just saying that saying like, well, if no one's ever told me there's harm and not having done the due diligence that we do on the back end or the other end rather for the for the benefits is not uh, is not sufficient. So now we're on the same page. So as I've alluded to, um, screening is the balance of benefits and harm. Uh, and this is as I mentioned, no different for the screening programs. So uh, this is a taxonomy of the harms of screening from uh, Harris et al. 
for lung cancer screening. So some may ask me, what is a harm? It's a very broad, they, they've used a very broad definition, which is any negative effect perceived, notice perceived, by the patient or significant others resulting from screened compared with not screened. A screening compared with not screened. So you can have a harm, and I can be like, mm, it's not really a harm. But it does, if you have felt a harm, then the threshold is quite low. The perception uh, uh, is counts. <coughs> So when the domains of harm they talk about in this um, paper are physical, psychosocial, financial, strain, opportunity cost. In, um, in newborn screening, we tended to concentrate entirely, or uh, mostly on the psychosocial. Part of this is because much of the um, focus has been on false positives, and much of the uh, A, uh, and that has come to light through people talking about anxiety and the thing of social distress of going through a false positive. The other part is that the financial strain is not necessarily there because theoretically these tests should be paid for by the insurance um, and most uh, children are uh, insured due to the uh, expansion of, of uh, insurance coverage in this country. That being said, you do hear now and again, a, we had to have this test and the insurance didn't cover it, et cetera, et cetera. That test being the, the follow-up, not the initial screen. The screen is paid for um, by the hospital, which was then reimbursed by the insurance company. So I say this is an interesting aside. For, so when people say, like, oh, we'll just raise money, we'll just turn up the, the cost of screening. Actually, most of the fee, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, most of the funding that comes directly from the cost of, this, or I should say the charge, is done through charging the hospitals for the car that's interesting, uh, financial organization, for the, the car that the screening is done on. The hospital, so some of my colleagues have been like, well, the hospital can just charge for the <coughs> Well, they're bundled with pain, generally speaking. So, like, you have a baby and it's like, they're not like, well, then you had lunch twice, and then, you know, you had an extra ice pack. It's, they itemize it, but then they give you the bundle payment. So actually, who pays for this, interestingly, end or the hospital? So another sidebar is that often on these different screen committees, you'll see, you know, because I was one, um, representatives from the hospital association, because they are the ones that actually absorb some of the costs. But it's like, as I learned, Marshall's not here, it's decimal dust. It's really decimal dust in, the, in their larger costs. But that's who pays for that fee piece of the screen. So, but these other harms are, but we just haven't focused on them largely. The this, as I said, originally, when, um, and, this, and this is nothing new, 1968 is actually came out of Montefiore, ironically, where I did my medical school. Um, this talks about the PKU anxiety syndrome. So, this is now 1968, so we are 50 years from this writing. Uh, medical science has been investigating in an increasingly urgent manner the prospect of testing newborn babies for literally hundreds of metabolic defects. Methods have been developed for measuring as many as 30 different enzymes with one microtube of blood or one or two drops of urine, and studies are currently underway to determine the range of normal values for the blood levels of these enzymes. So I would force point out that that sounds like it could have been written in 2018. It's the same idea of we have the technology, we can do more with less. We now have this process of testing for even more diseases and or conditions and disorders, for instance. Now here comes where they first start to see this. Since July 1st, 1966, we have seen a steadily increasing number of patients suffering from what we at Brown Street Civil Hospital that have come to call the PKU anxiety syndrome, presenting as acute and chronic anxiety, ranging in degree from mild periodic bouts to acute anxiety hysteria, Present in, it is present in parents who persist in their belief that their babies are or will become mentally retarded despite repeat negative tests and considerable reassurance and support from physicians. <coughs> One current uh, conservative estimate is we're seeing two to four such families a day. In essence, the patients are saying the test that the big uh, board of health department did show my baby was mentally retarded, the doctor in a little cubicle in the clinic did a test and said it was all right. He's reassuring, but I don't know. So, okay. This, this part of this, I think, if I had to pause it, lies in, you know, rollout of a program and communication. The question is how much of it. 
But this is a sort of gross presentation of this is not new. This is a phenomenon uh, of I've been told my child has something, my newborn baby, which has a whole other element we could discuss about the idea of being a parent of a child who looks well and then being told within days that they may look well but they might not be and what that may do to bonding, et cetera. Um, and then having this experience potentially have uh, ramifications. So I don't doubt that this is an extreme, I don't, uh, I acknowledge this is potentially an extreme case in some part due probably to less than optimal rollout, organization, communication. This is 1966. They probably just started that year. Um, you know, fax machines might have been new. I don't know. You know, the, the internet didn't exist, for better or for worse. But the element and the essence here is what is carried through over time. So what I'm going to talk about is the domains of harm, largely psychosocial, for false positive results in indeterminate slash diagnostic dilemmas. But I want to breeze through the false positives because I've done that. Uh, I did that last year, and you'll get the essence when I breeze through it quickly. I'm happy to go back to it. But we've already started um, the process of examining that on a, a national systematic national level in a systematic manner. But um, I want to also then pause to get everyone on the same page about false positives and indeterminate results and where in the testing process I am. So the first piece of this is the newborn screening test is done. And then you have two options. You can be within range or out of range. If you're within range, you often don't hear about it, which is a separate problem, but you go on your merry way. You may not even know this was ever done. And most, most parents don't know or forget that it was done. If you are out of range, you then have three next steps, three next options. You are um, a number of ways of following this up. You can either repeat the newborn screen, you can do additional testing. Some additional information, shall we say, is gathered, either by a repeat newborn screen or additional testing. And then you are classified into another of these three realms. False positive means your repeat testing evaluation is now normal. God bless, go on your way, you are fine. And from our perspective, this is the doctor in the little cubicle, we have now deemed you well. I could see, being a practicing physician, where from a patient's perspective, not understanding sensitivity versus specificity, being that the confirmatory testing is more specific and the sensitive is meant, meant to pick up as many people as possible, might remotely be at risk for the disease, that they go, well, one test said yes, one test said no, that's like the flip of a coin, how, how do I really know you're telling me the truth? I could see that. I mean, it just makes sense to the lay public of like, okay, and if you don't trust someone or you or things have not been communicated in the, in the most effective way. I can see how this could remain lingering doubt. In qualitative research we've done, or I did at the University of Michigan, this tends to, this qualitative, so I don't have any strong associations, parents tend to perseverate when I interview them a little bit more when there's some other co-symptom um, uh, going on that's unrelated but could be. An example is a tyrosinemia, um, will affect liver function. Jaundice is a common cause, is a common occurrence in uh, newborns. It is in part due to um, not yet optimal processing through the liver. When you tell this to parents, even though they are not related, they sort of see a potential uh, uh, alliance. And, and even the mother said, I remember clearly said the mother said to me, I was like, but they said that the jaundice was from the liver. I've always sort of wondered, or I wondered for a while, and then around nine months the kids would find something. I like let it, according to her, she let it go. That was the only person that sort of lingered in the about 25-ish interviews we did, in that, and, and I could see how, how that could be. But in general, we're like, you're good, you're done. True positive, to the other side to the left, is what, um, what many of us are understand to be like, oops, sorry, you, your child has the disorder. Um, they may look fine now, but we're concerned that uh, eventually they may not and they need, theoretically would have all disorders that you need to be treated emergent, urgently because we need to make sure that no symptoms develop and your child doesn't suffer any uh, uh, irreversible consequences. In the middle is this indeterminate, which has largely not been discussed in the word screening, and I'll get to that later. 
but that is where you're not quite normal, but walk quite abnormal, and we just don't know what to do with you. But I'll come back to that. Well, if positive, nothing's done, you go on your way. We have discharged you from the medical system from this perspective. And from indeterminate, you end up in a treat or surveillance mo uh, mode. So just very quickly, the, the, the theory behind the false positive is this idea of vulnerable child syndrome that we um, uh, originally green and soulless noticed that there were children that pick you who were previously well, had near-death experiences, recovered, and the parents, some of the parents sort of never recovered because the child had sort of a hit, a threat to their mortality, and that, that they then, subsequent to this, developed non-significant um, non but sort of lingering concerns about their health. How I interpret, how I describe it is, the child will have, a, a child with a vulnerable child syndrome state will have something happen to them that, at any sort of risk or threat or symptom, and it will be overinterpreted. You know, it, you know, the cough is maybe it's pneumonia. Um, you know, the bruises maybe it's cancer. Like everything gets over, and the, the risk gets overinterpreted, and the symptoms become. You then get this interaction with the parents uh, and the child of difficulty with separating infant, infantilization of the child, bodily over concerns, both parent and child, and then if, some have noted school underachievement. But our understanding of this in newborn screening is very uh, is it in, uh, in an infant health station, no pun intended. So this busy slide is where the end, of the, the end of our discussion on false positives is. Because in one slide, I'm going to show you a few things. I'll walk over here. So this slide takes you from 1980 to 2010. So what's that? 30 years? So this is the sum total of research on psychosocial effects of false positive results in newborn screening. You see how many boxes? Two, four, six, eight, nine boxes. Oh, I would argue like six, very minor. It's not even one, I think it's like, what is that, like one every two years, not even? First, so that's the sum total. The disorders that they're in range in these nine from hearing to hearing one metabolic, hypothyroidism two, the cystic, three cystic fibrosis, and uh, multiple newborn screening disorders. And I would argue cystic fibrosis was sort of late to the, uh, of all the disorders, you know, hypothyroidism was probably around usually in most states the second or third. The, the third thing to look at is um, the, and, and there are other studies that look at utilization. This is just psychosocial in this slide. The, the other thing to look at is the numbers, 32, 102, and, and no controls. These were called these days, 104. This is the largest here. 173 to 67, so 14, 20, not a lot of people. And then the next thing to look at is when they ever use a standardized instrument, most of the time with the parent stress index, one, two, three. So this is the sum total of our under, and oh, and expanded screening began here. Expanded screening was when, in many states, we went from eight to nine disorders on average to 30 to 50. So even after this, you don't know, have so much. This is the sum total of our understanding of the psychosocial effects of false positives in a test that's given to 4 million children annually since the late 90s, late 90s. Not a lot of data. Now, I do qualitative research. It is an important tool in my arsenal. <coughs> it has, like any research, even randomized control trials, has its limitations. What has unfortunately happened is we've used many of the qualitative studies not to generate hypotheses, but to, um, but to uh, determine, if you will, prevalence implicitly that uh, this is a problem, how big a problem is this, um, rather than take those qualitative studies and from that di um, examine the hypotheses that they've given us. So that was the point of my R01, which was we have unresolved issues. We have very minimal understanding uh, of this um, issue in newborn screening. And the so what is at the federal level, you can come to any of the meetings, they're open, because uh, it's a FACA committee, which means it must be open to the public. 
and you will see people debating about the harms of newborn screening based on this evidence. Mm -hmm. So it has policy, real policy implications that, um, that are, uh, that is creating, I would say, not optimally informed policy. So the goal is to the, I'm gonna, so we're, so I'm trying to close this gap where it's false positives and psychosocial uh, effects. So the first aim, we are to determine the scope and magnitudes of harm, psychosocial, behavioral, medical, um, parents and children do these false positive effects. And then um, identify factors associated with those harms um, due to newborn screening uh, false positive results. So the first idea is what's there and how prevalent is it? And the second is if it's there, who is most at risk? So when you go to intervene on them, number three, you can sort of, rather than intervening on everyone, I mean, you could, but that's not gonna happen. In the doctor's offices, I mean, it could. We should always strive for it. Um, we can find those people who are most at risk. I, the example I give, it's no different when, we always ask about postpartum, but we really ask about postpartum depression, but we really ask about postpartum depression when we know the mother has had a history of depression. Then we're really attuned to, uh, because we know that while others can happen and it's important and we still do our due diligence, our light bulbs go off in our radars when that happens. So if there are parents, let's say, who are, uh, conceived a child through IVF and had five miscarriages prior, they perhaps, I'm not saying they are, and one hypothesis could be a ring and they get a false positive, that might be the patient you want uh, you want to talk to and make sure that there are uh, or are not anything that you could do to mitigate. And and the goal, the idea here is that this that that communication may be a tool to to um, to mitigate these consequences. Now historically that that um, communication has been discussed as I know there are my psychology colleagues in the audience has been discussed as like, oh, it's just a false positive, it doesn't mean I keep like telling you things, like facts, rather than understanding the essence as to why you have this concern. And if this ends up being that these parents have this deep-seated anxiety about this, that sort of telling them again and again may just not be the, the way in in the communication pathway. But that is something that we can, um, we can hopefully uh, untangle in the, in the study. So now I want to go to leave last piece for the indeterminate. So I will say to you that this issue has become, I'm on the federal committee the last year and a half maybe. Um, it'll be, yeah, it'll be a year and a half, two years in, in the spring. Most disorders now we keep having the same conversation about these. Well, there might be some cases right in the middle where we're not sure what's going on. And it keeps happening again and again. The same conversation keeps happening. And we tend to not discuss these children or these potential cases. Um, and we tend to focus more on who we're helping, which is okay to focus on who we're helping, but we have this sort of possible collateral damage, I would argue, going on in the middle that we're not really addressing. The other challenge here is that, well, there are at least two I, uh, I think of. One is, again and again, and I was not, you know, a star student in uh, epidemiology and statistics, sorry, Jim, but I could get a few principles out of it, which was when you screen for a disorder, you find more cases of disease than you do when, when you are uh, prior to screening. Yet this is, this fundamental epidemiologic principle, again, it's like a testable hypothesis each time in the federal meeting. That, that we're having this conversation, like, and then we go back on the prevalence increased after we started screening. And you're like, yes, it did, because we started screening. It's just like breast cancer, and I, I'm constantly like, like breast cancer, prostate cancer, every other cancer, because our prevalence is determined by these clinical studies in which sick patients or symptomatic patients come to the clinic. Mm -hmm. That is the cohort of case that we have designed the entire test around. That is the definition of disease because they have symptoms 
and they have an abnormal biochemical and or genetic phenotype. <laughs> we start screening and we start by definition now having asymptomatic patients. The symptom goes up. And now we have biochemical abnormal phenotypes and or genetic abnormal phenotypes and we're not sure what to do. And we go like each time it's like discovering gravity. <laughs> oh my God, this happened. And again, it's happened for at least that been on the committee, I think three of the last four we've discussed, it's, it's come up. But we don't know what to do with them because, A, they don't come out that much in the studies because the studies are not really screening. So when we're doing these re this evaluation in the committee to say, well, should a disorder go on the rust and we're evaluating the data to date, that data is based largely on clinical studies. Like, okay, these kids came, we looked at their siblings who we knew might be affected, and from birth we treated them. They're not going into the, we, we don't see it because they're not go often going into the, to the, uh, to the population doing it. And then sometimes when they're doing it, they're doing it in another country and then we say it doesn't apply. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're sort of stuck in this way. The second reason this, so one is a failure to appreciate and anticipate the epidemiologic principle of screening and uh, case detection and the rise of case, uh, case detection cases. The second is, um, I believe, complicated by DNA. So prior to, uh, we'll use CF as an example, prior to um, using DNA in the diagnosis of CF uh, in newborn screening, the gold standard was sweat test. So you had a, a preliminary a screen test, it was an enzyme. The enzyme was either out of range or not out of range, a whole separate conversation about how that's determined. And then you went on and they did a sweat test. Now, assuming they can get the sweat from the baby, which is difficult and challenging, then the question was, how high a test, you know, was it hot, was it elevated, was it, mm, or was it normal? And then you were done. Now they in, now, then entered mm, in the, about, I would say, eight, ten years ago, more states started to do DNA. Am I about right? right yeah. So then we have two great gold standards. Now you have a problem. Anytime I'm doing two tests, even in the clinic, I'm like, mm, what happens if they don't disagree? And if you write your table, what happens if you're not concordant? And then we have, well, your DNA is not normal, and your sweat test is borderline or potentially abnormal, uh, or, or just normal. And then we have to ask ourselves, which do we believe more, the DNA or the, um, or the sweat test? <laughs> and so when we start to introduce DNA into the mix, we start to sort of, there is, I think, this sort of determinism that comes in with the genetics because the genetics are not normal, you're, you're, but we don't know, they're not what we know is to be the normal, um, the, the normal sequence, but they are not quite the pathological that we know. And then because we haven't seen this before, because remember we're doing this all in case definitions, this, it, cases that came forward symptomatically, we don't have the data, and so then we're left with a mm, better to treat you than not. So, um, the, and as a non-molecular biologist, I always thought this was fascinating and, and curious because, of course, if your DNA were normal, you would probably have a normal biochemical phenotype. The fact that it's slightly abnormal is, or I should say, that it's not a, uh, a read from the DNA that is so-called normal <clears throat> probably is collinear with the fact that your biochemical phenotype is not stone cold normal, um, due to redundancy, depending on what you hit in the pathway, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we're like, oh, it's not quite normal. Like, yes, because nothing about, this is all just in the similar, uh, the, the similar causal pathway. So this has led to, this is Jennifer Kwan, this is a neurologist um, in the state of New York, and Dr. Steiner. Um, talking about, uh, this was about Pompeii's disease. I'm fine, I'm just waiting for my disease. So the idea here was in Pompeii, which is a lysosomal uh, glycogen storage disease, uh, that they had patients who uh, ended up either being, uh, when we started screening them, and they knew this ahead of time, that they, so they were ahead of the, of the curve, they being the New World Screening community. You could have infantile severe, which is what we we're trying to help, you could have, um, a, or you could have late onset adult. And so the, the issue with Pompeii was, well, when are you gonna get sick? Are you gonna get sick early or are you gonna get sick late? 
And so now we're, gonna, now we're doing newborn screening and now we're actually dealing with what happens when you're late. The, the piece that this, this paper brought out was, well, what if you never, what if late never comes and the damn sleep story is still hanging above your head? So this was a, a, a case where not by newborn screening, um, but by another mechanism, the child had febrile seizure, found elevated enzymes and do 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 do, and then they found out that the child had um, a variant of Pompe that they knew wasn't in, infantile. And then like 20 years later, as you can see, this like the kid plays soccer, I think, but had like mild quadriceps weakness, like 20 years follow, and had never been treated. And so the argument, and this is in um, in uh, the UK, the argument was we probably need to hold off for, until people have symptoms with the $350,000 a year treatment, because we don't know that they have it. Which then became this study, which is some people like hey, some of the genetics. This article by uh, Timmermans and Buckbinder, which is Patients in Waiting, Living Between Sickness and Health in a Jomater. So I read the paper. I won't go into detail about the methodology and, you know, the potential limitations of it. They conceptually raise an interesting point, taking, tabling for a minute their conclusions and the prevalence of the problem and all these things, because we start to argue about things when we don't vehemently, when we just don't have enough data. But they raise an interesting point, which is what happens when you are not quite well and uh, not quite sick? And what do we do with these, these individuals? And I would say the reason why you don't see a lot of data in this presentation is because this is the sum total, Timmermans and Buckbinder, of the work that has been done on the experience of these patients. We have a lot of data that don't have in this presentation that um, talks about the classifications of who's where, who's a false positive, who's a true positive, who's indeterminate. But then we get this like pseudo, now we have like a whole new layer of like pseudo deficiency, uh, indeterminate. We've added like additional co uh, categorizations. But we don't know what happens to them. We just know like these are the numbers. The lab tells us, the program tells us these are the numbers. But anything beyond that is not known. And I will tell you, given that to the committee, one of the uh, staunch supporters of lysosomal storage. Uh, screening uh, was like, I'm, what did he say? He said, I'm sobered by the results, that the number in the middle was so much greater than he had imagined. And I was like, again, screening, like this, it, it, the numbers just crept up over time. This was, one of, this was from Missouri, one of the few programs we've had. So I'm going to give you a case example of this, and then uh, I'd like to get your feedback. This is one of the more extreme examples than um, I would say um, something like CF where you're not quite sure, and the reason it's extreme is because uh, of, about an internal diagnosis is because the, the morbidity of the treatment is so severe. So Crabby's disease, so does anyone know who that is? You do, uh, excuse me. Anyone? No? Oh, yes, the man, sorry. Uh, Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly. Oh, no. Sorry, Jim Kelly. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. We're getting married. So, Jim Kelly. So, Jim Kelly's on the side because Jim Kelly's son uh, had Crabbe disease. So, um, Crabbe's autosomal recessive disorder, another deficiency in an enzyme, this time uh, galactocerebrosidase, other <coughs> GAL, GALC, progressive deterioration of the central and peripheral nervous system. Four types. Infantile, late infantile, juvenile, and adult. So basically, at any phase of your life, you could get <laughs> you could get crabe. Uh, the one everyone talks about is the early infantile, which is what his son had, Hunter Kelly. So you detect it. You see the pattern here: enzyme activity and mutation analysis. And the treatment is a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which is not, although more common nowadays, which is not without its its um, its uh, morbidity. Without treatment, most children with early infantile die by two years old. In 2006, New York mandated universal screening. That's not, I would posit, an accident. And the federal committee has not uh, yet um, uh, rejected the uh, nomination to put it on the uh, national, on the RUS recommended uniform screening panel. So here's what happens if you have CREVE. This is an older slide, but the gist is the same. You end up with you go through a number of enzyme uh, activities. You're then placed into high risk, moderate risk, low risk. 
uh, there's another whole slide where you get a general DNA, but it ends up oftentimes like saying, yes, you're high risk, low risk, medium risk. Um, but remember the child's asymptomatic, so by definition, they, you cannot use their symptoms to reinforce your, um, your or substantiate your diagnosis. So if you're high risk, you go into, so this is your follow-up in year one, year two, you go into neurologic exam, neurodiagnostic testing, neurologic exam, neurodiagnostic testing. And then um, these exams come, and you see this asterisk in these tests, an MRI, which if you're an infant means you're sedated, CSF, which probably means you have some analgesia, uh, and um, these other tests. So it's pretty intensive, um, and it's fairly invasive. The difference being, you see here, how frequently you do these exams. Like, this is not rough, I mean, of course, but, but we don't know what they have, so we'll follow the high-risk ones more frequently, and we'll follow the lowest ones less frequently, and see what happens. Um, and the idea being, which is actually somewhat contrary to the point of newborn screening, I would posit, is that we wait until we see symptoms or findings on tests, and then we pull the trigger. We theoretically can pull the trigger. So we give up a little bit of lead time. We trade some lead time for making sure we're as close to the diagnosis as possible before we try to transplant you. So, um, and then I didn't get into like what I'm saying, if you get the transplant and how, plus you how the follow-up goes. So there has been very little coming out of what actual, again, I took the book binder, it's like the, the gist of the, the, the literature, on how many children are going through here and how many are actually failing to follow up. And, um, and what's actually happening to them during this period of time. And to uh, address my point that you don't think I'm crazy, uh, at least about this, is that um, this was published in 2017 in the Journal of Pediatric Genetics, Newborn Screening for Lysosomal Service Use. Very reputable, Boston Children's. And this is their talking about late onset of phenotypes. Now, what I haven't gotten into is also that like, Late onset can also become like a wastebasket for, um, late onset can become a wastebasket for you never were going to get it anyway. Because as I said once to the, one of the, the, the cystic fibrosis uh, director at one of my former institutions, I was like, well, but the child's six and hasn't had any exacerbations. Well, we don't know that they might not. I was like, so when is that going to be determined? Like when they're 21? Like, well, they could always have that. So when they're in the coffin, dead will be when they get released from their diagnosis of cystic fibrosis because you could always have the disease come. You could always be the one we don't know about. So sometimes we say late onset because we're like, well, you could be late onset. Um, although there are late onset documented. We just, I would posit, don't know. Uh, and there's many probably undocumented, especially for some of these disorders where, where the phenotype for a milder case is like muscle weakness. So then if you're older and at late onset, how much of it is old age, et cetera, et cetera. So then you end up, again, overlapping with something that seems common. Um, so this is 2017. One of the main controversies associated with newborn screening for LSDs, lysosomal source disease, is the identification of infants with anticipated late onset disorders. This has the undesirable effect of creating a population of asymptomatic children who are essentially patients in waiting. There's your 76. Uh, it also violates most international pediatric genetics ethics guidelines that stipulate screening is not advised for late onset conditions. Now, the feds would get around this by saying, well, I didn't, I wasn't screening for the late onset conditions. They were like the two for one I got at the store because I bought the first thing and then I got these other things and now I have to, and now I have these so now it's my due diligence. They're never ever the intended targets. They're always the incidentals that come alongside. Um, the new New York State Crab A program of for, for Crab A disease identified a large number of children as being moderate to high risk requiring aggressive clinical fault. There have been questions raised regarding the psychosocial impact such aggressive clinical fault may cause these children. There's also debate as to whether or not the level of gal activity in the genotype can accurately predict whether the child will develop early adolescent or adult onset. This has serious implications regarding effective treatment of the early infantile because if I get too many burdens, what, then it might flush the infantile screening down the, the drain, so to speak. There are similar concerns regarding late onset phenotypes Fabre. The question of when to screen for late onset is still under debate, but is continually, particularly considering the relative high incidence of this disorder. So it's a problem, which we already know is a problem. But um, we don't have much hard data about it. So I wanted to get some thoughts from the audience because I 
I'm willing to bet based on who I know is announced that I have a multidisciplinary group, which is outstanding, of um, thoughts about, one, potential outcomes of interest in a study of the experiences of these children and their families, thoughts about study designs and additional comments or suggestions. Um, because I, I think that largely um, this topic, so we went 50 years before the funding of a prospective trial of false positives in newborn screening, which would be mine. Then we, I don't want it to go another 50 years of, um, of studies uh, before we get a study that starts to look at what's the experience, but also quantifies. I think there's a qualitative piece that's here, or, or that there are important pieces relative to qual qualitative, but there's another important piece for those health care system and things like that. So uh, I welcome thoughts from the audience or comments. Yes? I mean, I think a lot of times it's difficult when we're talking about psychosocial outcomes. Mm -hmm. Certainly there are PTSD screening and anxiety for screening. Right, right, right. But looking at functionality, because I think we mm -hmm. see many special kids, special kids in the hospital who do have genetic disorders or period of childhood disorders, whether it's cancer or something else. And it, it really sort of stops and delays typical or neurotypical development. Mm -hmm. And when I think when you have any serious illness, whether it's real or, or potential, you stack your forward momentum in terms of moving from childhood to mm -hmm. adulthood. And those of you who take care of kids with cancer, you know when they get cancer and they go into the hospital and all that treatment, they don't progress normally in school or mm -hmm. in terms of their maturity, mm -hmm. if you will. And it's mm -hmm. only after they come out the other side and the cancer's gone and they're on their once a year checkup for their CBC, that they start to catch up with peers, but it, it takes a while. And I, oh, think, I think we forget about that, mm -hmm. and it's a big outcome. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. So basically, the, your delayed psychological, normal psychological development occurs and or puts you at, at um, disadvantage yeah. peer-wise. That's a good point. Oh, yeah. I was just, how are you thinking about which disorders to lump together yeah. versus split? Because, like, some of the disorders require stem cell transplant in the first few years of life before you die, mm -hmm. right? And some of them are not as mm -hmm. you know, severe. So, like, so I would do it. Good, good point. So I would use the same, which I talk about here, conceptual model. As I, I called it, um, a, si a signal receiver. receiver. And I'm not using that necessarily that term conceptually in other fields correctly, but a signal receiver issue. So um, the threat of having CF, so if we use CF and CREVE, the two extremes, um, it would go even less extreme or less severe than CF. If you have CF, you have a diagnosis that even if you were to have the disorder, I would argue the content of the communication to the parent would be it's a very treatable illness, people now live into the 50s and beyond, you know, this is a very, this is while may shorten your life, you will, you can likely live a, as normal a life as possible. Where is, or if you end up having it, and we, you know, you may have to be hospitalized, we'll take these medicines, but you may be taking medicines a long time, versus, and that's a very different message to a parent um, than your child could have a progressively deteriorating, ultimately fatal disorder, and to save you, I might have to kill you. So I think the answer is to, to split them, lump within conceptual categories as best we can as to the, the severity of the ultimate diagnosis and the severity of the treatment. So that Crabbe would go in one, cystic fibrosis would go in another, and then you'd find, if you could, another sort of middle ground to then sort of maybe tease out the effect of these severe cases. So what we did in the, we're going to do in the R01 is, you know, like 50 disorders, but largely what happens is um, most of them are much more prevalent. You can, we split them by time sensitive disorders. So if we think we need to get to you, like if you have MCAT and we need to get to you fast, um, uh, they, the um, community has done me a favor and sort of said these are the time sensitive disorders. So automatically now, or already I have a sort of caveat of these are, these are disorders that when the communication comes from the program of the physician, it's going to be like 
we got to act soon just to make sure what it, it, it is or is not the disorder, versus like, oh, these are the others. Now, there can be still a little heterogeneity within those. That's the sort of split, I think, that I could <clears throat> look at in these. And quite frankly, there aren't the, the, I would go after those groups rather than splitting it across heterogeneous, like, oh, what if you were a you know, severe from immune deficiency, what if you were a CFTR? I would focus in on these groups as best I could to, to tease that apart. And if it meant limiting the types of disorders, I, I think it's worth doing um, to see if you could tease it apart, as long as you can get the numbers. Excuse me. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, um, coming from UCLA, which was the cohort that he cited. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, that's right. <laughs> you're closest to the man. I've been doing this for a long time. But uh, I still have a great the idea of what the amplitude of the issue, the amplitude of the issue is. Yeah. So I know you don't want to talk about numbers, and you, no, no, we, you, you beautifully um, illustrated what the difficulty of understanding, of counting which ones are problems and not problems. But do we have at least numbers of the first steps, like like when you when you get a positive newborn screening, how many go into mm -hmm. the confirmed, infirmed versus possibly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't know how, yes, do we, no, how we big do, of a problem it is. We do know, and I'll call my genetic colleagues, we can say that, the sh I can say qualitatively, a shift has occurred where when we, and I was trying to find the slide in the, uh, to show you, when we were in the federal committee <clears throat> about a year and a year and a half ago, and Missouri, do you remember, remember this, when Missouri showed its lysosomal disorders, um, there was a bulge in the middle that the number of true positives it was, I wanted to say it's almost, I don't, don't quote me on this, like twice as many in the middle. Would you say? Yeah. <clears throat> it was like twice as many indeterminates as positives. Correct. Because yeah. of um, MDF, which was their big problem. Yeah. And long due to deficiency, which they had a huge population of true deficiency. But it would depend sort of on your ethnic group. Mm -hmm. Because that's very prevalent in the African American community and it's very common. So, and the, the other problem was then Illinois called that something else. Mm -hmm. So, so we still don't have so national we, data. No, we have state you data. Why like is the if they want to report it, right? So we don't you, have. Yeah, yeah. So you can yes and no. Okay. You have you're having the, like when they presented Missouri data, we were like, oh my god, they're presenting the data, and which is like the fact that like I have this reaction is like shocking. Uh, uh, it gives you a sense of the what's going on. We. We don't. We have states that have been tracking it and started early, like Missouri. I would argue, now to be honest with you, that there is an unfortunate conflict of interest potentially that emerges from showing your data, which is if you believe, and I use the word believe, that crab screening is good, then you don't want to show the data of how many children drop out. Because now people are going to say, like, well, then why are we screening for crab And you certainly don't want to do it if you're going to go back to the Federal committee. Now, theoretically, the federal committee is also going to ask you where the data is if you go back. But you could just sort of, you don't want, you want it to be, it looks good. We don't have, we don't show you what's going on in the middle. So, to your question, the short answer to your question is no, we do not have national data. We do not, we have data from some states. We do not have a request or recommendation from the committee that this data be collected and or made publicly available. So this makes research very difficult because in order to study crab A, I have to go to New York State and ask them to release the data, something which they may or may not be willing to do. As, 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 a, as an outcry from the state says, well, we're not going to, you know, to some degree, this could have been a lysosomal, like we're not going to do it unless you show us what, I mean, some leverage here is the state saying, like, well, we're not going to screen for lysosomal even though you recommended it unless you show us what the data is. I mean, that's one way to sort of push it. But the states decide what's released. And the committee, this is where the sum oversight comes, is a little bit, it, it does not push, if you will. Now, this is, I would also posit from a conceptual standpoint, is where I think the, dish, the issue, and Sam Burbridge coined this, not me, uh, newborn screening is, newborn screening is largely handled like a rare disease finding program, not a screening program. And it's a subtle, but I think very important difference, which is in a screening program, like when I've been in Europe and we sit down and I describe newborn screening, like 
the, the, these are heads of Australia, like the, the Dutch, they're like, what's going on over there? I mean, they're stunned at the way, the lack of, of data we have, just to your point about what's going on programmatically. That's because they're coming at it, they're all screeners. They're not, they come at it from a screening point. One works in colon cancer, then they moved over to uh, breast, and they move over, they, they're screening at the most common level, that's their lens. I would posit that in newborn screening, the community is tilts toward rare disease. So what that means is, in my opinion, not the opinion of the committee, door of the Children's National <laughs> my, my opinion is that that means that these bulges in the middle are sort of accept, seemingly acceptable, you know, sidebar for finding the cases. The, the presumption is it's to find those children who have infantile is so important that what was to occur, if anything, to the ones in the middle of the indeterminate is acceptable. My argument is you can't actually make that argument until you know what happens to the middle, either A, how many, and what's happening to them. But, the, but, but the, the, when you push and push and push in these federal discussions often, Right before the breaking point, when it looks like a disorder is on the verge of getting nominated or not, people will say, babies are dying. We have to screen right now. And that's when you'll see the identity sort of pop out of like the, 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 what I believe is the sort of the, the rare disease finding at any cost or at most cost. And so that's a long-winded answer to the larger cu cultural political context to why this goes on. We get this far and we don't get a release of the data. Um, and it's sort of like we're governing ourselves to some degree. And then you notice who's doing the study is not someone in the genetics community, the sociologist. And I'll be quite honest with you, I was a pariah in the field for about four or five years. And I was a, I was a physician, and so, but I wasn't a geneticist. And so, um, you know, people would put up my paper at, I remember very clearly Dr. Free, I was sitting in a room with my mentors preparing the K, and uh, one of the geneticists, Dr. Maud, said, oh, you were talked about at the recent um, the um, metabolic meeting. I said, oh, really? Yeah, your paper. Um, Dr. Ronaldo put it up on the screen uh, when he achieved, during his lifetime achievement speech, and he said, these people lie. They're wrong. They misrepresent the data. What they're saying is not the truth. And I was like, I'll never be able to, like, I was like my first year, I was like, I'll never be able to do work in this field. And Dr. Freed was like, that's great. And she was like, people are talking about you. And I was like, this is not what I was like. And I would go to meetings, and I, I, I remember also clearly, and these people now work with me, um, uh, or at least they're civil to me in public. And I was in a, in a, we were doing a lab tour, and, they, and I said, oh, hi, I'm Beth Serena Sanderson. And this individual who was at the, time very prominent in um, in a national group was like, oh, I know who you are. You, just, you do false positives. Like, it, wasn't, it wasn't meant to be a positive. So <laughs> the idea was that this is why you see those, those you know, caution, I don't think we should tear it down the, the kingdom, is that, is that the sense that there might be a potential issue to address um, uh, is needs to be delicately discussed. Or not needs to be, it, it often doesn't have to be, but you get your best traction if it's delicately discussed. And you also have to stand and weather the storm that comes with it. And, um, but I think as time has passed, what's happened is you can't ignore it because when they come to present for Missouri, it's like, well, here you go, here's the problem that, or the challenge that we've created. So, so there, there is a bubbling of, of, of issue, if you will. But the challenge for a study like this will be, which is the state to who, who which are the states that will allow us in, right, to do this. So, um, and doing this research from a, sort of from a development, uh, from a career development standpoint is, most of the issue has been sort of relationships, relationship building. So the R1 is not being done here, not because they don't have a relationship, just because Iowa and Minnesota were willing to do it. Utah was willing to do it, and at the time Michigan was willing to do it. Then every state is willing to have you work with them to identify these, these issues. The longer I've been in the field, and I, it is clear that I come in peace, then um, people have relaxed to some degree.
disagree because they're like, well, you're not Zimmerman in some ways. Um, although I don't think that, that ultimately what is said in that paper is anything shocking. Um, it, it, but it, it received a quite uh, heated rebuttal. There were books here. Oh, yeah, so Saving Babies. Yeah, saving Babies, question mark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but uh, my uh, comment is, which I know you know that, so I guess for the mm -hmm. good of the room, is that there is a quality problem, I, I would say, which I wouldn't say in a newborn screening meeting. But there is like, <laughs> there's a quality difference between the state's methodologies and how they are actually doing their testing and how they're actually doing their follow up if yes. they're doing their follow up. So, what is unfortunate about working with Minnesota and Iowa, which I would say have two of the most robust programs in the country, is that it's not going to be fully representative of the experience of South Dakota mm -hmm. and Alabama and D.C. Alabama is always on that list. <laughs> 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 roll Tide! So roll Tide! Sorry. From Alabama. Roll Tide! Roll Tide! Roll Tide! Roll Tide! But I heard a woman from Alabama speak, because at a newborn screening meeting, what always comes up is we need to do more prenatal education, we need to get the OBs involved, mm -hmm. uh, and that will fix all the problems with mm -hmm. parents not knowing about newborn screening. And someone from Alabama stood up and said, that's a really great idea, but we have to do to your point is we have a discourse problem in newborns, and I have no horse in the game. I'm not a geneticist. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I luckily get my job doesn't, you know, if newborn screen goes away, I'll find something else to study, right? But, but I don't have anything wrapped up in it. This goes into this conflict of interest that it was in the New York Times. I don't have any, I mean, I have money wrapped up in the ego, but I'm confident I can go find something else to study. There's a, this is a community and I would say in large part, should be proud of the work they've done. And they've, and they've invested their entire, some of them their entire lives into something that they, they believe in has truly been shown to be revolutionary and saving babies. When you start to question that it might not all be, you know, roses, uh, skittles and rainbows, these are my previous colleagues' uh, terms, then, then the, the, way, the wagon circles slightly. And, and that's to some degree, I think, a representation of the insular nature so long of that community. Once you, once you got tandem mass spec, from I argue from a sociological standpoint, once tandem mass spec came in and, and genetics and DNA started to enter, the field has been ripped open to the world and now more and more, I'm like nothing for their problems compared to what has emerged since then. But it's, you get this insular nature such that to your point, like I would never say it at a newborn screening meeting, like, but it's not, but it's science, and the mission is to improve the program. But, but, they, but you would, you, you know, people, some from Michigan got up and said they were going to the recent meeting, so they were going to remove, I can't remember, was it three MCC? Yeah. From the, and like I thought people were going to, like, she was, I didn't know she was going to make it off the stage. And, and uh, they're like, oh, I saw a child that died, you shouldn't remove it. And, and I mean, just a very passionate but personal. It was personal and it should not have been personal. And that's the challenge you face in answering this question, which is probably why we went 50 years before getting to this point. And state politics. And state politics, that is correct. Well, I think if you're going to do this, also, then you need to also do all the financial analysis. Yes, I think you're, yeah. You know, because that's the whole aspect you have in, in this, one. Have in this yeah. one. You need to do all the financial because there's just as much of an issue with mm -hmm. the lack of, if for every one that you identify yeah. with the severe, there are 500. Who undergo, you know, and, and you've got to do a global financial analysis. You know, the lost time of work, the, you know, the people well, who really don't have all the opportunities. The other us, square, also, you know, the, not just the diagnostics and the exams. I think. But then, but then, what in certain yeah. things, as we were just discussing, because I've heard this conversation, the conversation that we have, putting a price on the head of the child's perspective. No, correct, and, but that's and, what, this is why when you go to different. Europe, right? This is why you go to Europe, this is why, you know, in England they have. You know, a whole healthcare system that's based on actual value and care and deciding which things are effective use of care. You know, nice. And here in America, we don't have that. But America is going to move in that direction, right? You know, the way our healthcare system right now is untenable, right? And so people don't like making those, you know, oh, you're, you know, you're opening death squads by having the. It's all it's the no, same I, conversation. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I, and I completely actually agree with you. But, but, I mean, there are a whole bunch of things to figure into this, right? So it's, it's the experience of the family with the child who's waiting to get the disease. That's one component. We don't talk about it enough. 
There's the issue of all of the health care, and, and for every child who's at risk, they don't have equal access to health care. So the issue of health equity. It goes on and on, and there are multiple levels of complexity. And I think what I find most disturbing about newborn screening is that we talk about this as a monolithic population. You pop out of the birth canal, <laughs> American medicine is at your disposal to find all the badness that could kill you in the first two years left, and that's just not true. I think it would be interesting to see what the quality ends up being for some of these things, right? When you actually do a detailed financial analysis, right? Is it a million dollars for life, you know, for a quality of life here for some of these? I think that's a difficult analysis. So do I. But if you're going to do a prospective study of this, right, you sh I would really think that getting the as much financial data as you can prospectively as the financial study, are there data from Europe or from Australia for the efficacy and the numbers of in each category? And they don't really like they don't they don't they don't the the well, yeah. the They don't create the same problem. Yeah. They don't let it go to the right. they don't let it go. The study, oh, the process of valuing that's right. Nine, ten, first one, so something that's done in Europe as well, right? They do the process of how they yeah. 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 they have the same process. So the yeah. rounds are avoided. But they don't have the same treatments and they don't have it's, it's very difficult to compare data in that way. Not for the treatment, but for the even the categorizing. But what they're looking to capture and what buckets oh, they're looking at, I you could look at, but the numbers and or the types of disorders. But what they what like the UK will do in its like nice evaluation, for instance, yeah. So I add this point number one here, just to add one additional wrinkle. And it's been a while since I looked at the, the Krebs, New York Crab A study, but by recollection, there there were there were families who were in the kind of indeterminate mm -hmm. bucket who mm -hmm. subsequently, you know, were very thankful that they take oh, yeah. it and were, you know, were were appreciative that, you know, for the information and knowledge. Despite the fact you know, yes, yes. paradoxically that their child had yep. through all of this That's a good point. without any symptoms. That's a good point, because I leaned heavily on this sort of like, yikes. But it could be the thank you for making sure my child was well. This reminds me of Gil Welch's paper on screening for uh, cancer in which people were like, thank God I had the test. It proved I didn't have cancer, which was they didn't have cancer to begin with. They, they, they were they were proximal in their thanks. They weren't like, because they were like, I went through the machine and I was cleansed. But the question was, did you have to go through the machine? But but it is a, but but if they've handled it in a way that's been like, I don't have a problem with it, you know, and their child's not been like destroyed or their family, you know, as long as they're, I would say psychologically like okay with it, then that's I think an important outcome because they may very well be like that. Thank you for making sure. I think there are others also that probably are like the dissonance, and I'm out of my psychology realm. That's I'm looking at Maureen. Like the cognitive dissonance of being like, does my child have a disorder? Do they have a disorder? It's just maybe just so overwhelming. They're like, he looks fine. I'm done. And they just be just be out. We we start to be honest. Physicians who see this, like we start that process a little bit early. To be honest, like the you were talking about the vulnerable child aspect. Yeah. You know, we can see a screen that, that, for the most part, you know, given the context of the mm -hmm. child, it's very likely that this child's can, not going to have the disorder. Yeah. yeah. Right? So we'll sh we'll share that information. Your child likely doesn't have X Y Z condition. Oh, but by the way, if X Y Z should happen, so yeah, yeah. please call us immediately. Right? And then you're like, so there's, there's, there's already this. That's what he talked about, a little bit of the dissonance and the, yeah. the, the incongruity. I suspect that you, though, are different, not to, in a true compliment, you are probably in a 99th percentile, given your awareness of the issues of how you present it and that you're cognitively aware of, like, this dissonance going on and looking for pieces. But I know we're over time. I'm, uh, thanks, this was great. I'm happy uh, to come. One thing I would say to you is for something that's much more benign, because these rare diseases, when it's bad, it's really bad, oh, yeah. you die. You should, have, have you looked at the Japanese experience in screening for hematuria because of their very high prevalence of IgA nephropathy that can have a very, very bad outcome? They screen every school-age child for hematuria. Really? Yeah. I'll go, I only know the neuroblast. We will not do that in the United States because of all of the vagaries of our population. Yeah. And we saw it. Yeah, she Except for that one line that ran off, and I um, will, she will send that. She'll submit. We will get an email. Um,